A lot of us deal with everyday life stressors, and then when you throw a potential health crisis on top of that, well, we all know that's not a good combination. We do know that the hand washing and physical health precautions are good for us to do, but let's talk about protecting our mental well-being. Dr. Tracy Alloway is a psychologist and an author. Welcome to First Coast Living. We're practicing our social distancing here. Now, you've done a lot of research on the brain and how it deals with situations, so what are some you know, typical responses that we have as humans when it comes to something as stressful is this? That's a great question. And there are a few key things that we know are happening. The first thing that happens in a time of crisis is that our brain records it as a time of scarcity. We employ what's called the scarcity principle, where we feel like we're going to run out of resources. And this is some of the behavior that you can see right now in the media with the toilet paper and the paper products and so on where it may not be a legitimate threat, but our brain finds that that is the way that we can cope with the stress by feeding into the scarcity principle. So the first step is to recognize um, what is actually a scarce resource versus mm -hmm. what isn't a scarce resource. And I think that's kind of what a lot of people have questions about is at what point did anyone say to go stock up on toilet paper and why is that the thing to do? It's almost as if we kind of shift into this survival mode. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, that's exactly right. And so I think the way that we can combat that is my second point, which is to be proactive, to okay. recognize what you can actually do that will make an impact. So sometimes when you have a big crisis and now it's labeled a pandemic and we have schools closing, it can feel very overwhelming and out of control and we don't have any sense of autonomy. So a big part of my research is looking at how autonomy mm -hmm. plays a big role in buffering against uh, depressive symptoms and so on. So by picking just one thing to do every day that you are in charge of, that can make a big difference. So for children, you can say you're in charge of washing your hands, you know, X many times, put a little tally mark or something fun for them. They can win a prize at the end of the day. As an adult, what's that one proactive action that you can adopt that day so you feel like you have some control over the situation? Now let's talk a little bit about social distancing because we've been hearing that, you know, in every press conference, you know, from our local leaders all the way up to our president. Um, that can also, I think, kind of spark a little bit of depression because if you're an extrovert and you're used to being out and you're used to talking to people and having that physical interaction, how does that impact people, the fact that they need to kind of stay isolated? That's a great question. And there's a lot of research to suggest that as humans, we are inbuilt for social connection. One of the very first hormones that's released when we're young is something called oxytocin, which is a bonding hormone. So from the very beginning, we are kind of geared uh, and kind of driven towards seeking out companionship. So this can be a very difficult time for us. So again, the way to combat that is by being proactive and finding alternate ways to to bond, whether that may be online, doing things like this where you can FaceTime, you can Skype, so you can still see the person and you can still feel like you're having a conversation. Maybe it's a simple thing as you guys are watching Netflix, you know, remotely. They have it on, you have the same show and you're kind of chatting right. as you're watching that. So you still feel that sense of connection. But just to completely say, oh, I have to be separate and not seeking an alternative, you're absolutely right, can and will affect mental health. Definitely. So for me, you know, we I think we take a lot of pride on being strong people, strong mentally and physically. Um, mm -hmm. What are some signs that we need to be looking out for in case something like that, that social distancing is starting to impact us and we don't really know what signs to look for? That's a great question. So if you are a child or if you, you're a parent or maybe you're not a person that's very vocal about your emotions, I would look for physical symptomology. Oftentimes we transfer our psychological and our mental state into physical symptoms. So we may say, my head has just been hurting right. so much lately, or I have this shoulder pain or this back pain that just came up and I can't shake it. So again, we wanna compare that to a baseline. If it's a new sim physical symptom that's kind of sprung up as a result of all the stress, that could be an indicator that we're transferring our emotional stress onto a physical indicator. Got it. Now let's quickly talk about the kids because they're out of school in a lot of areas. I mean, it's gonna be kind of tough for them to really understand. So what are some things that we can do, you know, as parents even uh, to make sure that this transitions a little bit smoother and as less, least stressful as possible? 
And I think that's a great question. And the key thing here is to remember that we all have something in our brains called mirror neurons. And that just simply means that we mirror someone else's emotion. So if a, as a parent, you're reflecting a lot of this fear, this anxiety, this stress, your children are going to mirror that same negative emotion. So while it may be difficult as an adult, we really want to be extra careful when we're talking to our children not to project the sense of fear or panic to them because they will um, absolutely pick that up because of our mirror neurons. Got it. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Alloway. You guys can take a look at this segment one more time at our website, firstcoastliving.net. We're going to post this a little bit later.